Okay, so we'll start our second session today with uh, Max Riegler from Brussels. Okay. Can <laughs> <laughs> you tell us about the uh, warp black holes in lower steam gravity? Uh, yeah, thanks, Paolo, for the very nice introduction. And also, thank you for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk here in Europe. It's always a pleasure being here. And today, I want to tell you something about some work I've been doing recently together with Patsuo Asianagi, Stefan, and Stefan Tane, who are both in Brussels as well. Uh, and I want to talk about warp black holes in low spin gravity. So, before I get to the meat of my talk, I want to motivate three basic buzzwords that will appear throughout my talk. And the first one is Warp ADS3. So first of all, what is Warp ADS3? As the name suggests, it's basically a deformation of ADS3. So you basically take one uh, of the hidden vectors of ADS3, you take its full vector and you form ADS3 in such a way. So what does this deformation do? It basically changes your isometries to SN2 plus one out. Oh. Uh, and furthermore, it also changes the asymptotics of your space-time a little bit in a very interesting way. And why is this, this interesting to study? Well, these uh, space-times appear uh, for mean horizon geometries of extreme curve like those in four dimensions. For example, if you look at the fixed polar angle for these mean horizon geometries, then you find self, something that's called self rule space like warp ADS3. So in that sense, it's very interesting to look at these uh, three-dimensional geometries to learn something about the new horizon signal <coughs> curve. The second password I want to talk about a little bit is the warped CFT part. So first of all, what is a warped CFT? It's basically a quantum field theory with, again, global SN2 plus U1 symmetries, and you will see a pattern arising very soon. So I will be talking about these kind of symmetries all the time in my talk. And what's interesting about these symmetries is that very similarly to conformal field theories, they have an infinite number of conserved charges. However, an important difference is that they are not Lorentz invariant. These conformal field theories also appear as a dual quantum field theories or like possible dual quantum field theories for uh, these near horizon extremal uh, curve black holes. So in that sense, it's also interesting to study them uh, for holographic purposes. So that's the, that's the why part. The third password is the low spin gravity part, and since this is a high spin workshop, I also thought I'd talk about this a little bit. First of all, what are, what is a low spin gravity theory? As some of you might have already guessed, it's nothing else than an SL2 plus U1 transcendence theory. And it's interesting to study that model exactly because it's a very, very easy and simple model of warped ADS3, and in particular, it does not have local degrees of freedom. Because previously, other models like TMG, for example, that were used to model warped ADS space times, are, have some features that are not very nice in the sense that you either need meta contributions or high derivatives. So, in that sense, this is a very, very simple model to model warped ADS space times. However, what was still missing was the question okay, in this setup of lower spin gravity, can you also describe black holes? And if yes, how to do that? And some personal uh, intriguing question that I was asking myself is, okay, if that works with the black hole uh, description, then it's very, very uh, tempting, tempting to try to construct something like high spin warp ADS black holes. Because once you have a transcendence theory with a given gauge algebra, it might give it it's usually very simple to extend this straightforwardly to a high spin setup. When you say higher up, you generate this, is there a that's a very good question. I would like my that's one of the ways one could try to do this, but I think an even easier way would be to take SLN and use a non-principal embedding of SN2 into SLN such that you have SN2 and the U1 part. So that I think would be the easiest way to, to go about this, but of course the second uh, option you mentioned is, is also possible. So but this is still something that I want to think about, but this is an original motivation. Okay, so what's going to be the, the outline of the, of the talk today? I first would like to convince you that these theories allow for boundary conditions that include black hole solutions, and those asymptotic symmetries are those of the warp conformal field theory. And I would like to show you how to work out the thermal entropy in this setup, because that's something that's 
uh, not that not trivial uh, to start with. And the thing is, in order to determine this thermal entropy, we had initially initially I have to say we had to make certain assumptions. So the rest of the talk I would like to spend to do consistency checks whether or not these assumptions were actually valid. Because they might seem natural, the assumptions that we make, but we always have to check if your assumption is actually true. And we did this in various ways. The first one is to compare with what conformal bit theory results. The second one is to compute holographic entanglement entropy. I mean, this is interesting to compute this quantity for many reasons, but for our purpose, the nice thing was if you take the limit where entanglement entropy becomes extensive, you have an independent check of your thermal entropy that you computed previously. And the third one, I mean, that's the obvious one, uh, that's something we found out in the end, how one can actually uh, construct a metric interpretation of our John Simons results, and then you can explicitly check that all our assumptions are indeed valid. So that's basically the, the foolproof story of the part. Okay, so to get a little bit more specific, uh, when I talk about an SL2 plus U1 John Simons model, I want to talk about this action where we have here an SL2 part with John Simons coupling K, this is the U1 part with coupling kappa. The manifold M is basically a cylinder with uh, coordinates rho, t, and phi. And this bracket here, just for later reference, is an appropriate invariant for linear form on the algebra we are considering. And the first step here is to write down boundary conditions of our gauge fields. And I want to, would like to um, convince you by the end of this talk that these boundary conditions that I wrote here indeed describe space-like work black holes in two plus one dimensions. So this is what these boundary conditions look like. And the first step is, okay, I want to check whether or not the asymptotic symmetries that correspond to these boundary conditions actually yield a work conformal the field theory. And that you can do. This is a technical thing that's not so hard to do, so I will not leave you it. I will just flash you the result. If you do the asymptotic analysis, you find indeed a semi-direct sum of the Rosoro algebra with central charge C, where the C is given by six times the uh, SL2 coupling K, and um, a fine U1 algebra with, with uh, U1 level K kappa. And I have to stress that these kinds of boundary conditions, in our paper we consider the more general boundary conditions, but the boundary conditions I showed you here were already found a little bit earlier uh, in a very nice work by Diego Hoffman and Blaise Sambier in 2014. So th this part is, is not new, I just chose it because it's a very simple way of representing this work the AES black holes. And it shows that indeed these guys already found boundary conditions containing black holes almost four years ago. So that's what I wanted to mention. Okay, so that's basically the the most important thing uh, of, of my talk. If we were if we want to talk about black holes, then I would like to check whether or not the connection that I showed you before has a non-vanishing entropy. And the entropy should not only be non-vanishing; it should coincide with what one would expect from a space like what the AES black hole. So how are we going to do this? The first thing is to ask ourselves the question, OK, what is mass and what is angular momentum in this transcendent setup? How do I compute this? Because in the metric formulation, this is usually very clear what to do. It's the charge that's associated to time translations and <coughs> time translations. That's very clear. So but in the transcendent formulation, one has to think about a little bit more, not much more, but a little bit more how to do this. Once we have this, uh, the next step is to relate the inverse temperature and the angular velocity with mass and angular momentum in such a way that it's thermodynamically sensible. In the usual ADS setup, this is done by, for example, imposing certain conditions on the holonomy around the thermal cycle. And then, lastly, the last step is basically using the first law of black hole thermodynamics, integrate functionally to obtain the thermal entropy. And in these three steps, actually, two assumptions will jump in that we made initially. The first one is, when we want to determine mass and angular momentum, we assumed that diffeomorphisms and diffeomorphisms associated to the global killing vectors in this sense are encoded in the same way as in the ADS case, for example. So that's the first assumption. And that is used to determine what is mass and angular momentum in the transcendent setup. So at the moment, just take these assumptions as they are as assumptions, and I will show you later on that these are indeed valid. If we assume that, then it's easy to find the expression for mass and angular momentum in terms of this curly K and L that I used in the boundary conditions before. As you see, they are very easy. And then the next question is, okay, how to do this, how to relate uh, these two guys. I briefly mentioned in the AAS case, you just uh, use certain conditions on the holonomy around the thermal cycle. 
And it's very suggestive to do the same thing here in the work case, where you would see this guy would be the holonomy around the thermal cycle of one chiral left of the ADS result, for example. So this is nothing new that pops up. This is the U1 part, and as you see, the only thing, how, the only thing we did here is that we rewrote the first law of thermodynamics a little bit more in a suggestive way in order to define this H and H part. And then the second assumption that we made is, OK, the SN2 part should satisfy the same conditions as in the usual PPC case, whereas the U1 part satisfies very similar but slightly different conditions. You see here, this S is the generator of the U1 algebra in your transamics theory. And this gamma is at the moment an unspecified constant. So you see, in principle, that means if gamma is not an integer or zero, that the holonomy around the thermal cycle of the U1 part is potentially non-trivial. And I'm tracing this potentially. The motivation for this is we thought, OK, since warped ADS is a deformation of ADS, it might make sense to also see this deformation on the level of the gauge uh, of the holonomies. So you see that was the mic here. So this was, this was the first assumption. And this was something that we quite thought about quite a bit, whether or not this makes sense. But we decided to just go through with it and see what happens. OK. Using these assumptions, we, one is able to get very nice expressions both for the angular velocity and inverse temperature. And the last thing to do is basically to just integrate the first law. And doing so, one obtains again a very simple formula for the thermal entropy. And people familiar with uh, 2D CFT uh, and with, uh, so will immediately see, OK, this is just the chiral half of the Cardi formula. And this guy is something that looks a little bit weird if you know. However, this whole expression is, what you, is exactly what you would expect from a space like work that has So that's a nice thing to see that, OK, with these assumptions, we end up with exactly the entropy of a work that has But since there were some assumptions involved, there are some checks to do. And the first check is, OK, is this result also consistent with what you would expect from a work conformal field theory? And what you see here is the work analog of a Cardi formula. So this is basically the Cardi formula in CFT. And the relevant quantities here are not the central charges, but the more important things are the vacuum values of the mass and the vacuum value of the angular momentum. And this led to a third question. How do you define the vacuum in the transcendence? Because usually, if you would have a metric again, you would say, OK, it's the state that has the most symmetries. So it's the state where all your killing vectors become globally well-defined. But how do you do this in the transcendence formulation? And that's the third assumption. Our third assumption was, OK, in the transcendence, uh, trans usually the most important thing to talk about are holonomies. And one sensible assumption is that the holonomies around the phi cycle, where usually the horizon would be located, for the vacuum is just trivial in the SA2 part. And then again, we see here for the U1 part, we assume that the holonomies are not necessarily trivial, depending on this value of gamma. So that's how we put the work here. So those are the three. Those, this is the third assumption that we have to make that we made initially. And if we do that, we obtain very simple values for the, for the mass and for the angular momentum. And plugging these guys into the uh, warp CFT formula, we end up, again, with exactly the same expressions we found by the transcendence formulation. OK. So coming to the non-trivial checks, one is the holographic entanglement entropy. And this already Pavel told you less yesterday. Basically, what you do is, in the setup, you just attach a Wilson line at a surface, a cutoff surface very close to the boundary. And the only subtlety you have to take into account for the work case is that the boundary, uh, boundary QFT is not a relativistic theory. So you do not only have separation in phi direction, but you also need a separation in t direction to get the general expression for the uh, entanglement entropy. And since this is a very simple theory, splits into an SL2 and an SL2 and a U1 part. So this is something that Pavel showed you yesterday for the, for the uh, SL2 plus SL2 part, basically. And again, plugging in our boundary condition, we find a very simple expression. And people familiar, and I think everybody here familiar is, uh, is familiar with the 2 dct results uh, of ADS, for example. This is, again, just the chiral of ADS, what you would expect. And this is the U1 part. You see in the gamma popping up. Why is it in, so this, so looking at the entangled entropy is interesting from, for two reasons. One of them, it gives us the possibility to interpret this gamma uh, as, a, or give us a possible interpretation of the gamma. 
this expression that you see here is something that Song Wen and Zhu uh, did, um, found uh, almost two years ago. This is the most general expression for entanglement entropy at a given temperature uh, in a warped CFT. And you see here a delta popping up. The thing is, if you look at warped CFTs and if you map from the plane to the cylinder, you can tilt the cylinder a little bit. And depending on your tilt, uh, you will get different values for the vacuum mass of your theory. And if you plug in everything that we have from our theory into that formula, you end up with exactly this expression, provided that this delta that is the tilt in this interpretation is equal to 2 times pi gamma. So this gamma that we introduced with the holonomy conditions can be seen as the tilt of the cylinder of the warped CFT we're working on. However, this is, this is nice, but what is still missing is, as I said at the moment, this is, this is an undefined quantity. This is weird, because usually you start out with two parameters, which are your couplings, but all of a sudden the third one appears where you have no idea what value this one takes. So at some point we should fix what gamma is. So the theory should have said what gamma is. And this is something that only the metric formulation in the end will tell us what gamma exactly is. Then, as a cross-check, one, uh, one can take this limit where the entanglement entropy becomes extensive to read off the thermal entropy from this expression. And by doing so, one finds indeed again the thermal entropy right into the limit. So this basically tells us that the holonomy conditions that we impose around our thermal cycle were indeed sensible, because this does not rely on this. Uh, assumptions. The only thing, however, that runs the things, the assumptions that run into this are, however, how to determine the mass and what are the vacuum values. So it's not a foolproof thing, it's just a small check. So that's why we said, okay, we have to be more rigorous and try to find a metric interpretation. So that was the motivation for the last part of my talk. How can one get the metric formulation? The nice thing is, somebody did that already for us. So this was done by the, by Diego Hoffman and Blaise Rollet, the paper that I flashed you before in 2014. And what they basically found out that, okay, since the warp conformal field theory is a non relativistic theory, you also wouldn't expect it to couple to Riemannian geometry. So they said, okay, we have to work in a setup, or we have to build a geometry that couples to a warp CFT. That's what they did. And then they extended this geometry into the bulb. And by rewriting what they had, they were able to show that you can rewrite everything equivalently in terms of flow spin gravity theory that I showed you before. That's where uh, this model came from. And in order to get the metric out of this rewritten as the 2 plus u1 transcendence theory, you have to do a little bit of a, you have to basically invert this rewriting again to find the geometric variable. So if you want, these are nothing else than the dry bands and your local dry bands for a metric. So you do that by linearly combine your uh, H fields A and C using three parameters, alpha, b, and c, where this is basically, this corresponds to arbitrary scaling of time. This b encodes your warping of your space-time, and c encodes the AES radius. So that's what these, what these constants mean. And if you do that, you can straightforward the experiment and metric associated to your gauge theory, or to the boundary conditions that we impose. And if you choose certain values for B, C, and alpha that I showed you here, where this new here is the warping parameter, and L is the ADS radius, you will find exactly the space like stretch warp in the ADS like exactly. So that, that's a very nice thing and very pretty. And once you have this, the rest is basically computed. So in order to check our previous assumptions, then you can check two of the three assumptions by computing the killing vectors. That is, you find four killing vectors, two of them are globally well defined, which are time translations and five translations. And you can explicitly check that this combination of the killing vector with the gauge field gives you a gauge parameter that exactly preserves your gauge field, as it should. Then you can check that this assumption of the word vacuum is indeed sensible because if you take your four killing vectors, you find that only for the values that I've shown you here, the two former non-globally well-defined killing vectors become globally well-defined, giving four killing vectors in total. So the vacuum is indeed given by these values, which corresponds in the transcendent side to these expressions. The thermodynamics are straightforward to perform. Basically, for omega, you look at the general, you assume that the generator along the, the generator horizons is a null generator. And once you have that, you 